you're not going to be able to do that in 10, sec or 10 minutes. But it is the most kind of comprehensive case study breakdown, big topics you need to know. So, unit one slash four of social 20-1 dealt with national identity. Uh, we started talking about what national interest is, what nationalism is. Nationalism being the feeling you have towards the group you belong to. There are nationalisms, uh, ones that are very important, and non-nationalist loyalties. So nationalist loyalties being things that would fundamentally change you if you were different. So if you woke up and you were a different ethnicity, that would fundamentally change who you are as a person. A non-nationalist interest would be anything where it would suck to lose, but it's not gonna fundamentally change who you are. If all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're like, I hate Toronto Maple Leafs. Yes, that is an adjustment, but you're gonna move on. Uh, but where the problem comes is when those nationalist and non-nationalist loyalties end up contending with one another. So um, the contending loyalties, those are two things that compete. So for instance, um, your, uh, your identity, your, your sexual identity versus your religious identity. Those two things might come into competition with one another and that's when you need to balance your loyalties. How do you decide on which one is more important? Um, when it came to that, we had um, our first kind of case study, which was the French Revolution. We had a lot of people who were monarchists, people who believed that the monarchy was a sign from God, that people were chosen to be kings and queens, an absolute monarch. They got to decide that it was uh, what was best for their people. But that led towards a feudalist system where you had peasants that were born and died in the position they were given. So for years and years and years this goes on. And then we have King Louis XVI who just fumbles with the monarchy terribly. He starts overspending. He starts actually contributing to the American Revolution, which is only fueling the fire of his own people in his own country. Um, and you have this very bad social structure that has been developed over the years. Uh, the French Revolution doesn't come out of nowhere, as we've been saying in Social 20, and crazy doesn't just happen. It, there's background to it. So when you have your three estates, first estate being the king and clergy, second estates being the nobility and the aristocrats, and the third being the bourgeoisie, city workers, and peasants, 94 to 96% of the entire population rests in those two estates in the bottom two. So when everyone is poor, everyone is hungry, and they all want to change, this is when we get that spark that lights the revolution. Um, when King Louis XVI then goes to the second estate, which is again, a very small population, and says, hey, I'm gonna actually need to start taxing you guys because I fumbled my money up. Uh, they say, uh-uh, and they go to, um, the, they create the National Assembly where it's the second estate and the third estate come together and they come up with a new plan. Louis, thinking he can avoid this, just locks them out of the room where they make decisions. Turns out that they go to a tennis court, they make their own decision, which is called dot wrong, which is Declaration of the Rights of Man. They sign that basically creating what is known as a republic, a, a ability to democratically choose what's going to happen to your country. Um, then, 1789, July 14th, there's the storming of the Bastille. That is the first physical act of the French Revolution. Uh, and it was more of a symbolic act because no one was actually there, but it was an actual physical attack on something that was controlled and maintained by the monarchy. So after this happens, um, we start seeing that contending loyalties and nationalism can actually create a collective consciousness, an idea that people, even though they're not individually communicating with one another, they know and they get the feeling behind their nation that can drive it forward. So um, the Indian Act is one of the Canadian versions of this. The Indian Act, um, even though the Canadian government didn't go to every single indigenous person and say, this is what you're going to do, it, it was a collective consciousness. And it is an idea that the, the indigenous population in Canada still resent to this day. It still statuses their nation. It still has all of these things that create a lot of contending loyalties because how can you be Canadian but also Indigenous if you are labeled? Um, we also have Quebec sovereignty. We talked a little bit about that, the idea of the referendum where uh, the Francophones were so um, under the belief that they were being kind of iced out of this Canadian uh, individual nationalism that they had a referendum and very closely almost passed that referendum. But we did have the FLQ 
which is the extremist version of that nation that took over and kidnapped a senator and somebody died and there was explosions. You also had the quiet revolution with the um, Francophone language rights and things like that. We also have equalization in here. This is the idea of national identity that if um, the richest province help out every province. So this is this idea that Canada as a nation should unilaterally help one another out. And then we have the um, Assembly of First Nations, which is later developed was the idea and kind of response to the Indian Act, where instead of having white government officials make decisions on how the indigenous people are running their lives, perhaps we should have an assembly of the FNMI community creating those decisions. So that's when we got into our national identity. Next, we went into ultranationalism and the idea of extremism and nationalism. There's a lot of content in this one, so I'm going to kind of skim it as much. Um, World War I, we started with Maine. Remember militarism, we had an increase in um, technology, tanks, uh, the, the development of the machine gun, uh, planes, things like that. We also had a weird collection of alliances that were getting created at this point in time. And we also had a disdain for imperialism. People, had, by the time it came to 1914, people were sick of another nation being in charge of them. If my national identity is Bosnian, I don't want an Austrian-Hungarian person telling me how to live my life. So that's the disdain for imperialism and the rise of nationalism. Those Bosnians, those Serbs, those everyone started being like, get out of my country. You don't know our nationalist loyalties. You don't know our non-nationalist loyalties. Why are you telling us what to do? So 1914, we had a guy named Gravilo Princi that ended up uh, with his terrorist organization shooting the Austria-Hungary Archduke uh, Franz Ferdinand, kind of kick-starting World War I, but it would have happened before uh, anyways. It was just the spark that lit it. Um, we had the Entente versus the Triple Alliance. Uh, the Entente being the good guys, only because they were the victors. Uh, Britain, France, and Russia. The alliance being Austria-Hungary, Italy, and Germany. Uh, they competing against each other. Uh, battle, 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 four years, basically we get to a stalemate. No one is making any movement forward. Trench warfare has basically destroyed all of Eastern Europe. It is a big disaster. Um, it ends, and it ends with the Treaty of Versailles. Signed in 1914, the Treaty of Versailles has the war guilt clause in it that basically says Germany is to blame for everything. Whoa. They need to pay $33 billion in reparation payments. They need to get rid of all of their colonies. They need to get rid of the Sudetenland and the Rhineland, which is where a majority of their industry lies, so they can't even get money to pay back the reparation payments. Um, obviously, and as we said in class, it's kind of like an abusive relationship. If you slap someone so many times, they have two options. They either give up or they slap back, which leads us to World War II and the rise of a little dude named Hitler who comes up and says, hey, I can fix your problems. He has an ultra-nationalist view. He believes that Germany was absolutely um, screwed over by the Treaty of Versailles, that the Treaty of Versailles was uh, a, a thing basically to take down the power of the Aryan race and the Germanic people and take away Liebenstrom, which is living space. Um, all of these things lead to Hitler. 1933, Hitler actually gets democratically elected. Then he starts doing his little sketchy moves, right? Starts um, having people dressed up as uh, the Weimar Republic officials uh, beating up the Nazi party. Um, he starts spreading rumors about Hindenburg and how Hindenburg is an ineffectual governor and blah, 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 blah. He starts all these things. Starts with the indoctrination. Um, and people start to see that he is on the path to bad. 1935, the Nuremberg Laws are signed, which basically is the actual government official regulation of the Jewish community within Germany. Um, and then in around that time, you had the fire of the Reichstag, which is where Hindenburg officially basically signs over all the rights to Germany and creates an authoritarian government under Hitler's name. Uh, the rest of the world really isn't ready for another war. We had the Great Depression, we had a lot of issues, we had the Dust Bowl in Canada. You don't see it now, but you have the Dust Bowl in Canada. Um, all of these things where we weren't in a financial place to start another war, so we do a t tactic called appeasement, where we're basically like, no, no, Hitler, please don't enter into any more areas, and he's like, I promise I won't. And then he enters into what country starting World War II? 
Poland. 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 September 1st, 1939. He enters into Poland. From 1939 to 1935, there, or 45, there's many instances of straight up ultranationalist genocides that happened. Uh, the Holocaust is obviously one that we've covered uh, in extent. Uh, Holodomor, Stalin focusing on the kulaks of Ukraine. Uh, we had, well, I guess there was another ultranationalism in World War I when we had uh, the Armenian genocide. All of these things led to this kind of ultranationalistic explosion. We also had internment within Canada. Canada's hands are not clean. In uh, World War II, we interned the Japanese people, which is a form of ultranationalism. It's the idea, well, not as intense, we're not genociding them, but uh, we had ethnocentrism for sure. We interned the Japanese in World War II saying they were enemy aliens. We did the Ukrainians and the Germans in World War I because we said they were enemy aliens. This idea that your nation is more important than another is the main focus of Unit 2. Then we got to Unit 3, where we focused on the isms. Um, this is internationalism, which is a bunch of countries working together. Unilateralism, which is a country working alone. Isolationism, which is a country that avoids other countries. Bilateralism, two countries working together. Multilateralism, which is many countries working together. Supranationalism, which is an organization that represents a bunch of countries, the UN, EU, uh, NATO, NORAD, all those countries where you have an organization with a title that has a directive. Um, then we have the creation of the ICC, which is directly after World War II, uh, the ICC being the International Criminal Courts. Uh, that's where we started doing the Nuremberg trials, where we started punishing people for doing crimes against humanity and for having a Eurocentric, or sorry, ethnocentric and ultra-nationalistic views. <clears throat> and uh, we talked a little bit about how internationalism, because all the countries are now globalized and working together, we have the world debt clock, there is a connection between that, and is that a good or bad thing? And if it's a bad thing, it's called odious debt, which means that if you are in debt to someone, you owe them something. Meaning, they could use it against you. Or, on the other hand, it could keep you safe. So this last little bit was kind of a throwback to globalization, but at the same time, a connection to nationalism. And I'm done.